Only 4.24 to go in the half, so if they could somehow get down the field and get points on this drive, pretty much take up the half. Motion coming across from Colling on first and 10 from the 35. Clinch is going to throw, or at least try to, as he's chased and hit as he got rid of it. Clinch a little bit slow to get up. Abe Clinch, they're still looking at him on the sideline. Came to his feet very groggy. When they had the huddle, he went to one knee, got back up, they pulled him over, and they're looking at him and talking to him now. We know, as a matter of fact, very little about the brain, and we probably know a lot less about concussion. Third down and five, a little hole for Jordan Nelson. Breaks a tackle. Jordan Nelson down the sideline and knocked out of bounds. Concussions never came across my mind, and I never knew or became aware about them until post traumatic brain injury. If we would have these resources when I was younger, I think it would have had an impact on how I reacted to my first, second, third, fourth concussion. A concussion is an impact to the brain that results in a change in mental status. Concussions are brain injury, uh, but a milder form. They don't just affect a football player or a basketball player. It affects absolutely everyone. We don't have a uniform definition. And it's hard to measure still the forces and the cumulative forces, and how does that translate to trauma in the brain. I think that just the continued awareness and exploration of those issues hopefully will put us in a position where we can be more preventative. It's just putting a bunch of really smart people together in a facility that's set up for collaboration, and let's see what we can do. We're very uniquely positioned in the state of Nebraska to have some of the very best and most talented researchers here with interest in this area, facilities that are phenomenal. And so if we can get the research to really figure out why we're seeing what we're seeing and then provide the best possible treatment, that's a fantastic boost for the nation, but especially for Nebraskans who are here. Backed up near the goal line. Smith under center, turns, hands it off to Morris. I had never had a concussion growing up that I knew of. Uh, you know, I was always the one maybe giving other people concussions. But when I got to Nebraska, the players are much bigger. And um, so I, that's where uh, the concussions started. Blake Lawrence, number 40, a former linebacker at Nebraska, never thought much about concussions. He managed to make it to college without receiving one. That changed in 2008, when Blake received a hit unlike any other. My first concussion was in spring practice. I was going to tackle a running back, and it was a big hit. Helmets hit, and then my helmet hit the ground. I wasn't knocked out. I just felt off. Something felt off in my brain, and I went back to the huddle. When the play came in from the sidelines, I didn't know what the play was. I actually couldn't even tell you who the coach was. I was not aware that I was concussed. I just was trying to play football, but my brain wasn't working. Many athletes don't realize they have received a concussion. As these types of injuries have become more prevalent, education is key to making sure players understand some hits are different than others. A concussion is some injury to the brain. We think the mechanism that produces it is mainly whiplash. So this rapid movement to the head back and forth or to the side that perhaps is stretching some of the white matter tracts in the brain and that loses some communication between different brain areas. Doctors who study concussions are of the opinion, at least some of them are, that there's a difference in whether you hit a guy straight on or whether you cause a rotational acceleration. So the question is, which is worse? It's, it's, it's a little unclear at this point. During linear acceleration, the head's forward motion is stopped by a direct impact. Inside, the brain keeps moving, crashing into the skull. A lateral impact, like a cross punch in boxing, can cause rotational acceleration where the brain spins on its axis. There are a number of symptoms, that's usually the way we recognize a concussion has occurred, 
and the symptoms are things like uh, dizziness, disorientation, memory loss, lack of awareness of where one is in time, problems in concentrating, sleep disturbances, and headaches. The common practice for dealing with concussion is rest. It's rest from academics, rest from uh, the activities themselves. And the key is how long is the rest. The most important thing is early education and prevention of re-injury. So making sure that those athletes are not returned to play too soon, so that they're, they're at high risk for re-injury, that they get some time to rest and relax, probably stay away from screen time so we really minimize like TV, computers, and texting as much as we can in those first few days, and just allow the brain some time to rest. And then we ease them back in, first to academics, Return to learn comes first and then into play in terms of things that are higher risk for a potential other injury. Most symptoms disappear within one to two weeks. Uh, some may persist up to six weeks. In a relatively small number of cases, they persist much longer. The general notion is that once the symptoms have disappeared, the brain is back to being normal. Players with a concussion are more susceptible to receiving another especially within a 10-day window from the initial injury. A rapid succession of concussions is called second impact syndrome. Second impact syndrome is exactly the idea of that one plus one doesn't equal two. So there's something about the brain that seems to be more vulnerable to a second injury occurring too soon. Data on sports-related concussions shows that football has the greatest number of concussion incidences than all other sports combined. I wasn't scared after my first concussion. Concussions are part of football, and I knew that maybe it would happen to me eventually. But after one, I was not concerned for my long-term health. After his initial concussion, Blake received two more head injuries within a year. These injuries brought Blake to the office of head coach Bo Pelini. And I didn't know what it would be about because still at this point, after three concussions in, in a year, I didn't think it was a big deal. People get concussions, you continue to play. So when I walked into Coach Bo's office after my third concussion, he told me that if I was his son, he would never let me play football again. And I didn't know what to say to that. But that's the moment when I realized how serious concussions are. As he began to learn the severity of multiple concussions, Blake issued a personal ultimatum. Were he to suffer another head injury, his playing days would be over. When I suffered my fourth concussion, that ultimatum became so real. I look at the head trainer's door, walked in and said, I've had my fourth concussion and I uh, can no longer play the game of football. Blake's decision to abandon football at the time was unique. He put his brain to work off the field, launching a successful social media firm in Lincoln. A blocking foul called on Lover. Lover hit the floor hard. Sports-related concussions have been on the rise over the last 10 years. Today's research is helping identify more injuries. One big factor in the rise of concussions is the growing size of athletes. We're doing a much better job of training everyone to watch for this. So the coaches, the trainers, the parents, all of us are looking for it. But at the same time, we know kids are getting bigger and faster. They're training year round, they're conditioning. If you look at, take for an example, NFL lineman weight over the last 100 years, it's basically gone from 200 pounds to 320 pounds on average. Players are getting bigger. If you look at their speed, their speed has increased by roughly 10 to 15 percent. When you put those two together, you get about a doubling of the amount of energy on any given play. The National Football League's public legal battle is putting a spotlight on concussions. In 2014, the NFL and more than 4,500 former players reached a settlement in a case that alleged the NFL withheld information on the dangers of concussions. The NCAA also recently settled a lawsuit regarding concussions by creating a fund to diagnose current 
and former college players to determine if they've suffered these head injuries. As these high profile cases keep concussions in the headlines, new research and policies designed to protect athletes are on the horizon. The University of Nebraska-Lincoln is preparing to lead the way in concussion research. In 2011, the university began work on a $63.5 million expansion of Memorial Stadium. Included are two brand new research labs. In looking at it, we realized that we had some potential space over here. And um, so uh, we realized that uh, research on the brain, uh, particularly concussion research, was going to become more and more important. Um, and then also with that, we thought that uh, anything we could do in the way of research that would enhance athletic performance, safety, those kinds of things would be important and it'd probably be a pretty good marriage between the two. Then athletic director Tom Osborne signed off on building a national caliber research facility to better understand traumatic sports injuries in all sports. Back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, the general diagnosis for some type of a head injury was you held up a couple fingers and if you could come within one, you were close enough. And, uh, and you know, as long as you seem to be fairly coherent, sometimes you're put back out there. A collaboration between University of Nebraska athletics and academics led to the two research labs integrated into Memorial Stadium. The Center for Brain Biology and Behavior and the Nebraska Athletic Performance Lab. We're uniquely positioned across the country given the extraordinary collaboration between academics and athletics. The investment in the infrastructure, including the technology and the people that we have, the proximity of the research facilities to the athletes, the fundamental support from athletes, clinicians, researchers, coaches, and administration provides us with an unprecedented environment for being able to study concussions and other major injuries to athletes. The irony of conducting head injury research in a football stadium is not lost on those within the athletic department. I can't think of many uh, universities where in which the research facilities of this nature are in the football stadium. So there's a unique message to that and a very special message to that and it's certainly very Nebraskan, you know, we do what we say. When I uh, moved here I had brought about 12 high density EEG systems with me. Basically as 256 electrodes that fit over the head goes on in about 10 seconds so it's very easy to apply and it gives you information about speed of processing and it also gives us information about the order in which brain areas are being activated as well as which brain areas are being activated. So it's a very uh, great tool. It's one we're actually developing to use on the sideline. Player comes off the field, you put the net on and get an index uh, within five minutes whether they really have experienced a, a concussion or not. The main attraction within the lab is the inclusion of a functional MRI. Not only is its placement within an athletic facility unique, but researchers can use the MRI in conjunction with the EEG units to collect even more brain data. We're getting this high density EEG activity. We also can be collecting the MRI scans. Plus, in addition, we have an eye tracker, so we can present visual stimuli. No place else in the world at the moment has that capability. We're collaboratively working with the Center for Brain Biology and Behavior to understand the long-term consequences of events such as concussive events on the athlete's function. And our goal is to help define the optimal rehabilitation strategies that we can use to help athletes to recover. The brain is an exquisite control center. Uh, it's able to handle large quantities of information and process them and then cause the body to move. One of our areas of expertise is studying how the body is moving using our biomechanical equipment. We can understand the output of the brain on the body's movement abilities. That creates a wonderful opportunity for collaboration because Dennis is able to understand the intricacies of the signal processing within the brain and we see the peripheral output of that. Whether that's studying how the football player throws the football, how the basketball player makes the layup, we're able to quantify the, the human functional performance aspects. 
we don't have a uniform definition on what is a concussive event and how does that translate to trauma in the brain. One of the areas of interest that Dennis and I have is in identifying a biomarker, perhaps a salivary marker, that would help to reflect early on what is the trauma to the brain. It is these research initiatives, like finding potential warning signs in athlete saliva, that will change the way we immediately diagnose concussions. We still don't know a lot about concussion, and so the scientific community, we're limited in the kind of guidance we can give the NCAA and the NFL, uh, among other uh, groups, in terms of what things need to be done. Education is clearly a paramount in all of this, and also changing the social climate. The general perception is that these big hits only happen on the collegiate or professional playing field. In reality, concussions can happen at any level of play. Never really thought about concussions that much when he was doing like midget football. And I don't know, I just never, never I guess you don't think about it. I always thought if Brady was going to get hurt, it would probably be on the soccer field, since they don't wear any protective gear on the soccer field. I always thought, well, they're all protected up in football. There won't ever be any problems in football games. Brady Barron had a bright future. He excelled in academics and was an exceptional football and soccer athlete. At 16, Brady tied a Nebraska State soccer record with 13 consecutive shutouts as a goalie. He planned to play college soccer for Creighton University, but that all changed on September 24th, 2004. He got hurt in the first quarter, and they had to come out and help him off, and he was out a few plays. Then he came back in, and after he played a while, I made a comment to his best friend's mom. I said, he's, he's like a step slow. It was during the third quarter of the game, and I got hurt on a kickoff return. I was going to go block someone over here, and then someone came over here and uh, got me on the head helmet to helmet collision. A coach came, helped me get up, because uh, I was slow getting up and walk off to the sidelines. And then once I got to sidelines, I collapsed. When I walked down there, his eyes were rolled back, and he was starting to foam with the mouth and stuff, and I didn't think he was going to make it. Brady was rushed to the hospital where he immediately entered surgery to stop a brain bleed. The odds were stacked against him. I had less than a 10% chance of surviving surgery. Doctor had done this type of operation three times before. None of those patients ever made it beforehand. Brady survived the surgery, but was placed in a medically induced coma. The doctors hoped the coma would help his recovery within 48 hours. Then Monday comes around and they take him off the coma medicine and they tell us he should be waking up in eight to 10 hours. Well, 12 hours later, he hadn't moved a muscle. And I asked the nurse, what's going on? She said, that's not good. When Brady finally awoke from his medically induced coma, five weeks had passed. The doctors never really told us what was gonna happen. We just thought he'd wake up and everything would be okay. It's not like you see in the movies, you know, when you come out of your coma and you're like, oh, mom, I missed you, how are you? <laughs> Nothing like that. When the brain's involved, I still think we don't know that much about it. They kind of prepared us for, you know, they said he may never smile again. So, I mean, it was tough, let me tell you. One of the first things they do is to help me get to learn how to walk. It takes five people, one on each side of me holding me, holding me up making sure I don't fall down. One person helped me move my right leg. Uh, fourth person behind me pushing a wheelchair so I needed to rest, I could sit down and rest. And then the fifth person in front of me saying, take step with your left foot, take step with your right foot. And the first time I made it up walking, I made it five sets, which was a pretty huge accomplishment for me. The rehabilitation process was long. Brady's drive to overcome the challenges ahead surprised his doctors. They said I wasn't going to be able to go to college. When I was in college, I didn't think I was going to be able to graduate, even from a community college. Graduated from a community college, I didn't think I was going to be able to handle a major university like UNL. Graduated from UNL and then have held, you know, two different full-time jobs uh, while being married. And it's just been, yeah, 
just showing people what the human body can do and what a strong spirit can do is something that I enjoy doing. As Brady's condition improved, positive change starts to improve protection for all youth athletes across the state. Back in 2011, I was approached by uh, a representative uh, of the NFL who was uh, interested in passing um, a bill that would address concussions uh, as a result of sports injuries. Senator Lathrop introduced the Nebraska Concussion Awareness Act. Brady Barron and Blake Lawrence helped legislatures to push the bill into law. Nebraska became the 13th state to pass such a bill. Now, every state has a similar law for youth athletes. It has two components. The first is to identify the student athlete that suffered a concussion and then take them out of the game. And then we have a process for having them evaluated, getting them cleared to return to action, and when they can, then they go back to play sports. So that's the first and maybe the primary piece. The second would be education. The Nebraska Concussion Awareness Act specified that education must be provided on an annual basis to parents and coaches within the school systems and within other youth sports organizations. It was important to me because I didn't want any more families or student athletes to you know, have to go through what my family and I went through, the difficulties and just everything, you know, emotions, financial, just the different changes. It, you know, I'm very happy that it did get passed. All this concussion education, if we would have had these resources when I was younger, I think it would have had an impact on how I reacted to my first, second, third, fourth concussion. It's crazy to think we had to go seek out information about concussions. Now, concussion education is everywhere. There's a reason why people default to football, and that's because all the research studies on structured team sports have shown football to have the highest percentage of injuries, or the highest incidence. But girls soccer isn't that far behind. Come on, Katie. That's what we found in the Nebraska concussion study, as well as what's showing up nationally. But every year I see individuals with concussion in volleyball and track and all these other things, because you can fall over a hurdle. I mean, things happen. In addition to education provided to coaches and parents, many schools employ athletic trainers to help diagnose suspected concussions on the sidelines. A combination of immediate and follow-up testing helps ensure athlete's safety. Schools and trainers use testing, like impact testing, to gauge an athlete's recovery. The cognitive test combines baseline results which were conducted prior to the season with results taken after the suspected injury to help determine where the athlete is in their recovery. It kind of covers everything. You know, it's good to have, you know, something to look at where we can have a baseline and have, you know, a post-injury test. When cleared, the students can then make the transition back onto the playing field. The kids are pretty responsible, you know, in reporting their own symptoms just because of having that information available to them and knowing what signs and symptoms of a concussion might be. Awareness because of this kind of legislation uh, is invaluable. It really brings home to a lot of people how critically important uh, concussion is. It's true that Harvard and Yale and McGill invented American football, but it's been Nebraska that's really applied science, if you will, uh, uh, to the game to improve it. We were the first people to have a field turf stadium. We had Boyd Epley's whole program, which was really, really cutting edge at the time. And I see the developments in East Stadium as just being a natural extension of that. The neat thing is that it's not just about football, it's about all sports and sports performance. And, and I won't be in the least surprised if some of the sports-related studies, for example, that, that uh, Dennis Mulfees is doing in terms of diagnosing concussions, will be hugely influential just in the general medical community in, in the coming years. It's not going to just stay in sports. I think Nebraska has been a quintessential trailblazer, not a follower. And so this is an extension of 
our culture and who we are. So um, I think, as you know, we're, we're not doing these things just to be the first or to do them. We're, we're doing them because it's at the heart of everything we do. Nebraska is taking steps to lead the charge in cutting edge research and awareness of concussions. How we prepare for and deal with these injuries is truly heading for change. It's very encouraging to be in a state like Nebraska that is moving forward and you know trying to stay ahead of the curve during my recovery and still now. I am continuing to speak, just sharing the hope and encouragement of you know what, what a positive attitude can do for you. To know that our state has an opportunity to lead the way in concussion awareness and concussion education, that's a pride point for our entire state. And just as much as we're known for football, maybe someday we'll be known for the state that helped change the sport to protect the players.